My name is Vanessa Brusso, and I'm originally from Santa Kilowak, Nunavut. I grew up in Timmins, Ontario, which is a small town of about 50,000 people. It's a mining town. My mother volunteered as a president of the Friendship Center for over 20 years. She was also a trustee on the school board. She also sat on race relation boards. Me and my sister grew up together in South Porcupine, which is about 15 minutes away from Timmins, which is even smaller. We had a lot of fun uh, growing up in the small town. Uh, we had a lot of uh, imagination um, because we didn't have very much uh, money or toys or material things. So we played games such as um, TV tag, um, school. I was often um, the teacher and she was a student. Um, we would go to the museum and play in the mining trains that are set up outside. Um, we did a lot of fun outdoor things together, me and my sister. Growing up in Timmins, there was no other Inuit and it was very hard um, not having your culture or your food or just people to be surrounded by. So my mother chose to immerse us in the indigenous culture, which was Cree. And I grew up learning the Cree traditions and culture, which I hold dear to my heart. My mother always made sure to be proud though that we were Inuk. I had boots that were made out of seal skin that I wore to school every day. I practiced drumming and things like that. I practiced beating. Even though there was no other Inuit in Timmins, I managed to immerse myself in culture. My sister's name is Pamela Holopainen. She was born in 1981. She's two years younger than I am. I always had the motherly role with my sister. Uh, we were very, very close. Growing up, uh, she was outgoing and carefree and outspoken and um, very um, attitude-y, I guess you could say. Um, she had a flair about her. Um, she lit up a room. Everybody knew who she was. She was a very, very kind person. She'd give the shirt off her back to you. I remember when she was about 10 years old and I was 12 years old. Um, I told her if she licked the pole, it tasted like candy cane. And it was minus 40 in Timmins. And of course, my sister listened to me and she licked the pole and her tongue got stuck to it and she wasn't very happy with me. Um, thankfully, we only lived a block and a half away and I went and got my mother and um, she came with a cup of hot water and got my sister's tongue off the pole. My sister um, didn't finish high school. She ended up dropping out in grade 11, but she always worked, no matter what. So uh, I remember one time she was a waitress, and I never thought she would be a waitress. She only lasted for about a week. It was really bad. Um, because of her attitude, she couldn't handle it. Um, so she didn't do that. But however, she ended up working at a call center in Timmins and that was her last place of employment and she did really well at that job and it was she was there for over a year and she was getting maternity benefits and everything so I'm very proud of how hard she was determined to keep on going even though she wasn't successful in getting in her high school diploma. She had uh, a boyfriend almost every week she was in love um, she enjoyed uh, socializing and always being with friends um, she would fall head over heels for these boys too in the little amount of time that she'd be with them. Um, but I guess in the end it was what made her happy. Eventually my sister ended up settling down and she had two beautiful boys, um, Seth and Michael. Uh, they're now 17 and 19 years old. She was being a wonderful mother. Um, she was making sure her children never had junk food. Um, you know, she was making sure they were um, well fed and taken care of. Their laundry was always done, that they were always bathed. So on December 13th, my sister asked me to babysit, but unfortunately I already had plans that night. Um, so she ended up getting another babysitter. Um, she went to a house party and that was the last time anybody has seen her was leaving the house party. On December 14th, 
is the day my sister went missing, but we didn't know she was missing at that time. I remember going to her house on December 15th, December 16th, December 17th, and every day I went there, there was plants in the window, the stroller was there in the porch, and the doors were locked. There was no footsteps, nothing. So I assumed they were all together enjoying Christmas somewhere with family, his family. On December 25th, my sister didn't call. I was upset. I couldn't believe that she didn't call me on Christmas Day. I waited all day for her to call me. I, I was distraught. I couldn't believe it. December 26th came and I went to the house again. Nobody there. Nothing changed. So I decided to call her landlord and ask if he's seen her. The landlord said he didn't see any of them, not her kids either. I assumed again that she was just being selfish and she was enjoying her time with her family and she was just being busy. On December 31st, we were at the bingo hall in Timmins and my mother and I were approached by a woman who said to us, did you hear about Pam? And we said, no, what about Pam? And she said, she left. So well, where's her kids? What do you mean she left? And she said, her kids are with the father. Right then and there, I knew something wasn't right. And me and my mother went to the police station and reported my sister missing. My mother and I went to the Timmins police on December 31st to report my sister missing. And when we went there to report her missing, because it was New Year's and because my sister is Inuit, they told us that she was probably out drinking and she'll be back in a couple days. So after we reported my sister missing, the police did nothing. As a sister and my mother, we couldn't just stand by and wait and hope that she would come home. So my mother and I took initiative and we fundraised money from the community to make posters of my sister and print them and put them up everywhere so that there was awareness at least. It took the Timmins police nine days to put up a missing person poster in the paper. After nine days of us reporting her missing, that's how long it took, and my sister was already missing for two weeks before that. The Timmins police didn't start actively investigating my sister's case, probably for four or five months. And even then, it wasn't done right. The case eventually ended up being handed over to the Ontario Provincial Police. You think it was better there, and it wasn't. The officer that was in charge of my sister's case at the Ontario Provincial Police was charged with attempted murder and arson and went to jail. After that happened, I haven't spoke to another Ontario Provincial Police officer since. In 2013, the Timmins Police got the file back from the Ontario Provincial Police and they told me now that it's not a closed file but not active. So they're not doing anything and that's 12 years ago. I'm guessing that the police are waiting for remains. I believe that the police are hoping that they find remains and then they can move forward with the case. That's honestly, that's the only thing I think that they could do. Or unless he, the person admits it. I couldn't be more disgusted with the treatment that my family has received from the Timmins police. Four months after my sister went missing, they called me and my mother into the police station for a meeting. We came into the police station. There they showed us nude pictures of my sister on their computer screens. And they told me that my sister was a prostitute in Hamilton. That one gets me. 
is so gross to say about somebody. The worst part is, is this officer who said that to me has a daughter of his own. And when I confronted him about this, he says he doesn't remember. Having your family member being treated like this, it's embarrassing, it's disgusting, it's shameful, and it's absolutely wrong. They looked for my sister at the local dump and then posted it all over the press. To live every day knowing that I don't have closure is really hard. It's, it's mine boggling. I remember being in the Toronto airport about two years after my sister was missing and I seen somebody there that looked like her. I followed them until I could see their face and when I seen their face and it wasn't her I was so ashamed. When you watch the news and you look in the background for people when you're looking for your sister or when you take drives in the bush and all you see is remains you're looking for remains you're not looking at the trees anymore or the flowers you're looking at the for remains you want closure you're trying to find signs where is she my mom died four years after we reported my sister missing to the day. I can't even imagine as a mom to not know where your baby is and for no one to look for her. So now my sister's been missing almost 17 years. It took me 17 years to get to this point. It took me 17 years to be able to talk and to be able to speak. It took me years of intense therapy to be able to live a healthy lifestyle. In the end, it was my resiliency inside of me that continues to grow. I continue to be a survivor. I know I deserve to be happy. I know I deserve a life. And I know all Indigenous women and girls and Two-Spirited deserve this. They deserve to be safe. So I feel that now that I've had time to heal, that it's my time to be their voice and ensure that my sister is not forgotten and ensure that her truth is told. And that's why I'm here. And I'm proof that you can do it. I'm happy, I'm happily married. I have two beautiful boys who I raised successfully. I have a good job, I'm a good person. So it shows that we can do it and we do deserve it. So after 17 years of my sister being missing, I am strong enough and I feel that I am, have a voice and I have truth to be shared. I feel that I was robbed of that opportunity with the National Inquiry. I was never given that chance. They ignored me. I've tried emailing them. I did articles with CBC News. I tried to email the Prime Minister. I've done everything to try to have a voice and nobody's listening. Eventually my lawyer ended up serving them with my testimony so that it would be included but I never had the opportunity to give my truth. It is not public, um, but at least it is on the record for my sister. So now I try hard to advocate for MMIWG2S. I do so by making these pins. I make necklaces and earrings. I do uh, videos, short clips on YouTube to create awareness um, about MMIWG2S and explaining what it really is. Um, I sit on boards um, and I always do uh, presentations for um, people in groups. I've been doing a lot of uh, speaking, public speaking, 
um, to create awareness and um, I'm just volunteering my heart to it. This is, this is my passion and this is not going to go away. Nobody's paying me for it and I won't stop for all our sisters. As a mom of two sons, I know my boys aren't safe either. I know that this is happening to our Indigenous men and boys and I worry about them as well. I hope um, that our future children have a safe environment to live in. I hope that our future children um, could live in peace and feel safe knowing that nobody's going to hurt them. So for my sister, what I want is um, I won't stop until I find her remains. And that might be forever, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay for doing this forever. I've accepted that a long time ago. But I also want to prevent future family members having to go through what I've gone through. I don't want family members to experience the pain I have. It's painful enough. I want the government to take action. I want the government to enforce the 231 calls for justice that the National Inquiry has said that needs to be done in order to keep us safe. There's a genocide happening and Canada's doing nothing about it. We are all standing by and watching as it happens and it's going to be way too late. It's sad that we protect animals more than we do Indigenous women and girls. I think that in due time things will change. I think that with our voices together we become stronger and I think that with all of us working together and uh, encouraging you know healthy boundaries and healthy relationships I think that all of us could live in a very safe world um, I think that it just takes some time and some people to step forward and take accountability and put put into action the plan.